All right, well, uh, welcome to Introduction to Intermittent Fasting. Uh, my name is Ramon Sedano, Coordinator of Fitness Services uh, and Education over at Washington State University's Rec Center. A lot of you have met me before, come to my webinars, or watched the recorded versions of them before, so I don't think we need to go through a huge introduction portion. Um, uh, but this was a highly asked for webinar, so uh, we've done quite a few. We're getting a little nutrition based as of recently talking about ketogenic diets, protein and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I'll refer back to some of those when we get into certain topics that you might be able to get more information from those because that will pertain to some of the stuff that we talk about. But it seemed that a lot of you were interested in learning more about intermittent fasting as it is quite popular at the moment. There seems to be quite a few health benefits from it. Uh, with that, I will first off say that I am quite biased towards intermittent fasting. I have been uh, doing it myself since 2013. Uh, I've seen multiple individuals of clients, friends, uh, honestly, hundreds of individuals benefit not only from the body composition aspects of it, but also from any metabolic markers and, in my opinion, neurological factors, which really haven't been tested on human subjects at this point uh, or on any of the clients that I know, but I have seen it practically in my own opinion. So I just want to front load by saying, that I am, uh, you know, pretty biased towards uh, uh, this, but I did do a lot of my own due diligence. Back when I first got into this, I did a whole thesis proposal on intermittent fasting, uh, where I came probably across, I can't even remember, I have a slide up here to show you a bunch of the articles that I'm utilizing for this information. So it's not me just speaking off practical application, um, but also a lot of the information that's been put out there. However, when I first did that research, uh, most of the studies have been done in rodents or in animals such as monkeys and stuff like that. Uh, there was few human studies at the time when I did that research. So I did another review. Um, I've uh, actually did my thesis on uh, utilizing a meta-analysis and systematic review. So I understand how to uh, you know, mine and look for lots of research on a certain subject. So I did that recently for this webinar itself and I came across a lot more human trials with certain things that we will talk about. I will again front load with that any of the stuff that we do talk about the neurological system, all of those benefits and uh, possible drawbacks that we might talk about came from rodent studies and not from human studies. But a lot of the metabolic factors that we'll talk about have come from human trials. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of start with that and kind of front load that way, and then we'll just keep moving on. Um, well, I guess we'll use the mouse. So our agenda for today is first, we're going to remember jerk. So if any of you watch my nutrition made easy, three principles to uh, healthy eating. Uh, jerk is a large concept within that uh, webinar and a large concept that I base all of my nutrition protocols off of. I should remind anyone who maybe, or not remind, but inform people uh, who have not seen my webinars before, not only do I work for the rec center here, but I'm also an adjunct faculty instructor for the kinesiology programs. And one of the classes I do teach is sports nutrition. So I do have some, you know, credence when it comes to nutritional development, nutritional protocols. Um, so uh, JERF is a concept that I did not come up with. Um, me and a friend, actually a friend probably came up with the acronym, but the concept was definitely been developed for a long period of time. So we'll kind of revisit that real quickly. Um, then we'll talk about what is intermittent fasting. We'll talk about, you know, what it is, what it isn't, kind of the ideas and concepts behind it. And then uh, we'll get into certain types of protocols because there's multiple different types of protocols when it comes to intermittent fasting. Are we doing alternate day fasting? Are we doing time restricted feeding? All those kinds of concepts, we'll kind of break down what each one of those are. We'll vaguely talk about individual markers that we see benefits with those when we're talking about the protocols. However, we typically see that all benefits uh, that uh, arise from fasting happen in all the different protocols, but we'll still kind of foreshadow or, you know, let uh, front load those a little bit uh, before we get into the actual benefits. Then we will talk about some misconceptions when it comes to uh, fasting. We'll talk about some fallacies that have been developed and some incorrect thought processes that are uh, kind of, you know, spout off in popular media, media about intermittent fasting. Then we'll go into the benefits, then we'll talk about some drawbacks, and then we'll have time for questions. But first off, I just kind of wanted to show, uh, this is a large side of a bunch of the research I did. This is actually not everything because I started writing this maybe like 25, 30 minutes ago. Uh, it's been a while since I've done some APA formatting, so I had to remind myself how to do that. But this is just some of the research that I utilized when creating this webinar along with my practical experience. 
uh, that being with myself, clients and, uh, you know, employees and friends and things like that. So just showing you that I'm not coming at you blind. I am coming with some, you know, hard evidence that is peer reviewed research. So, okay, before we get started, let's talk about remembering GERF. So if you remember, GERF stands for just eat real food. When it comes to nutrition, in my opinion, and from what I have seen, I don't care how often you eat. I don't care if you, what nutritional implementation that you're utilizing. As long as you are maintaining a, a diet that is based off of real foods, not highly processed, you know, things that our bodies have developed over a millennia through evolutionary biology and the evolution of our digestive system, you're going to be able to maintain proper health, okay? So JERF again stands for Just Eat Real Food. And this concept, me and a colleague came up with it when we were trying to identify why there were so many metabolic problems such as type two diabetes and other metabolic syndromes in westernized societies, but you're seeing that in other uh, societies around the world that they were very healthy, had longer lifespans, were not suffering from all these different metabolic diseases that we see in westernized societies. And what we did when looking around and kind of identifying the macronutrient protocol, protocols of these different societies, you know, that being macronutrients, being carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, is there wasn't one really distribution where, you know, the key idea was high carbohydrate or the key idea was high fat or the key idea was high protein. What we saw was from these different civilizations that some were, you know, high in carbohydrates, some like hunter gatherers were high in protein and some were high in fat, like our classic Inuits and things like that, was that they were actually deriving their food sources dominantly from real sources, right? They were plant-based, they were animal-based, they were not factory farm, they were not mega agriculture, mega farming, those kinds of things, right? Highly processed. I mean, if you want more information about the GERF concept, and this idea of where it comes from, you definitely need to watch the Nutrition Made Easy uh, webinar, which is exactly like how it sounds. It's some protocols that don't make you think about counting calories. Don't, it's not overwhelming. Just three easy principles that are going to be able to help maintain healthy, uh, a healthy lifestyle through nutritional uh, implementations. And uh, the basic protocols that we do have from it is going to be one, eating from the rainbow, which is eating fruits, vegetables, and meats of all different colors. That's going to be able to assist in your micronutrient profile, which are the uh, micronutrients are essentially going to aid in the metabolic functions that take place for you to produce energy and create the metabolism that you use to create the energy in your body. Um, we talk about the KISS principle, which is keeping things as simple as possible, buying foods with the least you know, additives and least ingredients and things like that in there. And then also shopping the perimeter store, which is typically where we see, you know, all the fresh food products going to be at within the store. When you start going in the aisles, you start seeing the Cheez-Its and the Twinkies and what I call the cardboard carbohydrates that are highly processed that our body over time did not, you know, have time to evolve to be able to learn how to digest. So in this webinar, we talk about, and I go all the way back to our earliest ancestor, which is Australopithecus, which is a couple millennia ago. And because in my opinion, that's when our digestive system really started to evolve. Um, you'll see that I, some of the researchers talking about uh, intermittent fasting will refer more to the late Paleolithic era when we were actually true humans and homo sapiens and those kinds of things. But the thought process is the same as that our, uh, our digestive system evolved over a long period of time with natural foods, right? With physical activity and also when we talk about intermittent fasting in a feast famine kind of state. And it's only been really within like the last 200 years and honestly even more much sooner than that where we've had a drastic change in our food supply of what our food is made of and also the abundance of our food that has really seen a good correlation with the drastic increase in the metabolic syndromes and the uh, dis uh, diseases that we're seeing within westernized societies. So the reason why I bring up jerk is while intermittent fasting is great and there's benefits to it and stuff, at the end of the day, I am much more concerned that you utilize or my clients or if you're somebody seeking out to be healthier to maintain a jerk style or a jerk lifestyle of a diet before they even go through different nutritional implementations such as intermittent fasting, right? In my opinion, your intermittent fasting diet should be still a jerk based diet. Intermittent fasting is not a reason to be able to eat whatever you want on your non-fasting days. With that, we do talk about within the jerk or the Nutrition Made Easy webinar that 
there is this thing that we call the 80 20 rule. I'm not expecting you or telling people that you always have to eat the best foods possible, always stay on top of it, right? We no longer live to survive anymore. We kind of live to enjoy. So we need to develop some discipline and some temperance when it comes to our food, uh, the, the food choices that we make. So trying to be as good as possible for 80% of the time, but then still enjoy the fruits of life that we have that are developed during holidays, times with our families and stuff, and not stressing over when we make the decisions to have a cookie or have a piece of cake or go out for pizza with our friends and stuff. As long as we're maintaining a healthy lifestyle for 80% of the time, it's going to be able to have a, draw, a, a strong lasting effect on our health. I don't want to go too much down the rabbit hole with the jerk protocols because you can definitely watch the other webinar on it. And I would suggest to watch that webinar before even getting into one on introduction to the ketogenic diet, on the protein 101, because that's going to be the basic factors that everything else relies on. It is literally the base of the pyramid of all these different protocols. So please remember jerk and utilize that in whatever nutritional implementation that you're using, whatever you decide to do, if it's six meals throughout the day, if it's two meals at an intermittent fasting standpoint. That's the most important thing at the end of the day because those foods are what your body has been developed to process and utilize at the metabolic level through our bioenergetics to develop this energy that we utilize, not only for mechanical stimulus, but for cellular turnover, basic respiration, and just basic functions that keep us alive. So again, not trying to go too deep into that, but definitely if you haven't watched that webinar, I'd say pause right here and go watch that because it's going to be the most beneficial out of all these when it comes to easy things that you can do to increase a healthy lifestyle. So, okay, what is intermittent fasting? All right, essentially what intermittent fasting is, is a way to mimic the eating habits in theory that match how our metabolism evolved, right? So we kind of talked about this uh, in the jerk lifestyle, but what a lot of researchers are going to say is that our genome was developed during the late Paleolithic era. I talked about going all the way back to Australopithecus, which is, you know, a couple of millennia ago, but that was our earliest ancestor. The true Homo sapiens are going to be more around 50,000 BC and coming up to 10,000 BC is honestly when, you know, agriculture started, right? But they are saying that or suggesting that our genome with regard to our metabolism, our digestive system, you know, existed during hunter-gatherer times. And these were times when we were in a feast famine kind of standpoint where there was not an idea of when the next food source was going to come, right? And there was a lot of physical activity that was interspread in between those times for looking for food, whether it came from hunting or foraging, right? So there was long times where we had big oscillations in our energy stores because we would be able to find food, we'd be able to hunt the buffalo or the mammoth or whatever it may be, we would eat it and then there would be another long period of time where possibly food was not available to us. So it is, it's a, a it kind of comes in this concept dealing with the thrifty gene that we don't really need to get into, but this is where a lot of the researchers and proponents of intermittent fasting are going to base the idea of why humans should utilize intermittent fasting as a style of nutritional implementation. So what we see now, and again, this was touched on uh, a little bit in our Nutrition Made Easy webinar, is our current lifestyles do not support or how our genome was developed with regard to our digestive system. Because right now we live in a time where we have a massive food abundance. The USDA actually produces enough food each day to supply each American with 4,000 calories, right? That is crazy because you even see on typical nutrition labels that it's all based off of a 2,000 calorie diet because that's dominantly the average of what our American population has for a total daily energy expenditure. Obviously, individuals with more muscle mass on their body that are larger individuals are going to have a higher metabolic rate, but getting up to around 4,000 calories is pretty big. And that's, that's going to be, you know, your Michael Phelps is, well, he was way above that, but individuals that are going to be high-end athletes that are burning lots of calories, have a lot of muscle mass on their body, and they're doing a lot of physical activity. Those are individuals who would need to support around a 4,000 calorie diet, which is a very small percentage of our population. So the fact that we produce this much, this much calories per person is just crazy with regard to how our body has developed over time, right? 
Along with this, we have a lack of physical activity, right? So a lot of us, our jobs at a desk all day where we're no longer actually going out to seek our food. We actually live in a time frame now where you sit at your desk and you want everything at your fingertips. You have Uber Eats, you have Amazon delivery and all this kind of crazy stuff, right? To where you're not even doing any amount of physical activity to get your groceries. You're not even driving to the store to walk the aisles of the store to be able to get your groceries. So the lack of physical activity is increasing and increasing and increasing, right? And then those two things combined with a mass amount of food abundance and a lack of physical activity is going to result in crazy amounts of metabolic disorders being developed, obesity being developed, and we see these things happening right now. Along with this, we have something that we, that's called hedonic hunger or hedonistic hunger, right? And this is the drive to eat or uh, to eat to obtain pleasure in the absence of energy deficit, right? So essentially humans evolve to crave energy dense foods. And this is for the fact that energy dense foods are going to be able to be stored on the body for a longer period of time. So you have to understand through human evolution, our bodies were smart because they did not know when the next famine was going to come. So not only when we eat our food, does our body like, oh, we need to expend this to utilize calories to produce energy. Any excess that we have, the body's like, I'm going to store this on myself because I never know when the next famine is going to come. So I'm going to utilize this energy later on down the road. Now, we have evolved to crave energy dense food because that energy dense food has the ability to be stored on our body for a longer period of time for the fact that it has more energy, i.e. calories in it. So even the presence of desirable food or even the thought of it, the smell of it, just the mere anticipation of it makes an individual hungry because we are predisposed and preconditioned to crave this food. And now this is in a, in a time frame or in a society where we have this massive food abundance that's super affordable of all this energy dense food, it's a huge combination of issues that may lead to a lot of these obesity or to the obesity epidemic that we're seeing or to the metabolic dysfunctions that we're seeing. So, I mean, susceptibility to food cues can lead to overeating, especially in a society where everything is readily available in inexpensive energy dense foods. So such hedonistic eating kind of overrides the body's ability to regulate consumption with satiety. So even though you have eaten all this food and you probably should be full, you were preconditioned to actually want more of that food just because your ancestors would have never realized when that next uh, uh, meal was going to come. So all these things are just, you know, an equation for a disaster with how our bodies are supposed to function because these things really have not come in development for us, but in very recent times. And the body needs a lot longer or just any system in general needs a lot longer of a time to be able to evolve to handle such things, right? And then like what we talk about in our Nutrition Made Easy webinar is all the different types of foods that aren't even natural that the body can't even essentially deal with or know how to digest and handle properly. And finally, what we do see is this idea of like how food is marketed and how diets are marketed and things like that. So we see that there's about $10 billion each year that's put out for food marketing and also for diet marketing. And one thing that definitely does not make money for these individuals or for these companies is fasting. There is no money in not eating. So what you see in these diet protocols is eat this to lose weight. Don't eat this to lose weight. Get points for this, lose points for this. And they're all based on foods that you should intake because a lot of these companies are more inclined to increase their revenue in a supply and demand style of society rather than telling you, maybe you should just take a break from eating for a little while. And what we see from this is a massive obesity epidemic, right? On average, we see that men have an average of 25% body fat and females have an average of 40% body fat. Each one of those numbers is in the obesity range. So average Americans are, in, are all obese. And this is something that, it, it's not just because we don't enter in pastors, it's a big, big correlation of all kinds of things put together but definitely there is things that we can do to be able to adjust this. So some of the things when it comes to what is and what isn't 
intermittent fasting. So the basic definition that we have of intermittent fasting is the act of willingly abstaining from some or all food and in some cases drink for a predetermined period of time, right? And the key word here is willingly, okay? And what we see is we, it's this idea of a fed state versus a fast state. Typical westernized societies and individuals within westernized societies spend about 20 hours a day within the fed state. So as you see, there's a note down here and it says our bodies are designed to eat food when it is available and use calories we have stored when food is scarce. So essentially, as we are eating food, we are storing, like we'll use, if we need some cool calories expended, we'll expend them at that period of time. But while we keep eating, we're in, we're in the storing phase, right? Essentially, uh, I saw a good uh, uh, YouTube video, I forget the, the uh, doctor's name, but he compared it to like a metabolic fridge. We just keep putting things in the fridge, storing things in the fridge over and over and over again but we never take things out. Then we start to overflow the fridge and we have to get another fridge and we're doing things like that. So we're constantly staying in this fed state where we're never actually tapping into those reserves to build off what we have stored. Because while we're storing stuff, we have enough of the energy that we need from what's coming, what we're currently taking in to you know, support the calories that need to be taken out at that point. And the rest just gets stored over and over and over again. And it's crazy to think that there's 24 hours in a day, and on average, we spend about 20 hours in this fed state. One uh, thing about uh, intermittent fasting that's nice is it's a non-restrictive approach to food choices. And what I mean by this, and I'll give an example of a certain uh, uh, intermittent fasting strategy that we'll talk about, which is called whole day fasting, right? Whole day fasting is a way where you would fast maybe one or two days out of the week for 24 hours, right? So on Monday, you stop eating at 8 p.m. and then you eat again at 8 p.m. on Tuesday, right? So that's a 24 hour fast. And on Thursday, you stop eating at 8 p.m. and then you eat again at 8 p.m. on Friday. So you have two days out of the week where you fast for 24 hours. Now you would eat what you normally eat every day out of the week. There's no minimizing this food, no min maximizing that food. It's what you, again, you should eat sensibly. We should try to maintain by that jerk lifestyle, right? We shouldn't be overeating, just essentially eating at what we would consider our caloric maintenance level on those other five days out of the week. So we don't have to restrict ourselves from the foods that we typically eat, right? There's no rules that are being broken. There's no feeling bad when we eat something else here. So it's an easy non-restrictive food approach, which can result into 20 to 30% of a caloric deficit each week that will help lead to weight loss among a lot of other be uh, beneficial metabolic factors that we'll talk about. So you don't have to go crazy and think about, I get points for this, I get points for that. This is bad food, this is good food. It's a non-restricted way to be able to make food choices, which is very nice and seems to be a little bit more uh, able to sustain for people. And with that, it's an easy way to create a caloric deficit, right? You don't have to think about each day I need to eat under 500 calories of my total daily energy expenditure. It's just two days out of the week you don't eat, right? You just drink water, coffee, things that have zero calories in it. And finally, you have to think about it as a lifestyle and it's not a diet, right? Because you're changing the way that you eat food, right? And essentially, you're just going back to how our ancestors ate food, right? It's only been recently that we've come up with all these ideas of why to eat six meals throughout the day. And I'll talk about the fallacy within that and how uh, the, uh, uh, the idea behind that is faulty and things like that. Um, but it's, it, you have to think about it as a lifestyle and not a diet, essentially. So what it isn't is fasting is not wasting. You are not going into starvation, wasting your mind, um, uh, muscle, depleting your body. That's only going to happen when you're in extreme calorically restricted states for long, long periods of time. Fasting is not wasting by any means. It would be ridiculous for the body to have evolved over time to start wasting away at its muscle when you have not had food coming in for 16, 24, 36 hours, which was consistently happening to your ancestors. Evolution states that it's going to try to have survival of the fittest take place. And when you are going to develop something to be able to survive, you're not going to create things that would actually damage the host. With that, fasting is not magic, right? It's by no means is a magic. Um, fasting itself, just in a caloric maintenance, if you're maintaining your caloric, uh, uh, like your weekly uh, caloric total to not lose weight or gain weight, you're not gonna lose weight. We know that in research, the only way to actually lose body weight and body fat is to be in a caloric deficit, right? So if you were just doing intermittent fasting, but you were eating in a surplus or you're eating at your caloric maintenance uh, in 
on average for the entire seven days a week, you're not going to lose weight, right? The only way to lose weight is to be in a calorically restricted state, but there is some benefits when do, utilizing intermittent fasting versus a calorically restricted day, uh, uh, state or limited daily feeding, okay? It's not magic. It's not going to fix everything. You're not going to you know, gain 20 pounds of lean mass and lose 20 pounds of fat in a matter of a week, okay? It's something that has to be consistent. While we talk about the evolution being a feast famine kind of individual, when I say that it isn't a feast famine style of eating, what this means is it kind of goes into the next bullet is it's not an excuse to eat anything you want on your non-fasting days. I actually just had a friend ask me about this. He's like, does it mean I can eat whatever I want on my non-fasting days? No, absolutely not, right? We still want to eat sensibly. We want to have the best quality of foods coming in because remember those foods are going to break down into the nutrients that preside, provide the enzymatic functions that take place for our metabolism and other cellular turnover processes take place in our bodies. And we want those to be able to maintain at the highest optimization possible, okay? So it is not an excuse just to binge eat and do whatever you want on your non-fasting days. And finally, it's definitely not for everyone. I know individuals that just do not like the lifestyle. Uh, they cannot, uh, they, don't, they get too hangry. Um, in my opinion, they just don't give it a long enough try to be able to manipulate their hormones that kind of maintain that. But some people just don't like it. They really enjoy having, you know, their eggs and stuff in the morning. They don't want to have to skip breakfast. Honestly, with intermittent fasting protocols, you don't have to skip, you know, breakfast. Uh, if you don't want to, you can manipulate your hours differently. But some people have certain preconditioned patterns that they want to be able to stand by and it just doesn't fit their lifestyle. And that's fine. Again, the most important thing when it comes to healthy eating is maintaining that jerk style. Okay, so talking about some of the product protocols out there, and there's all kinds of different protocols out there. There's way more than this, but the, they all fall within one of these kind of uh, uh, frames, frameworks, okay? So first, we already kind of talked about uh, the whole day fasting, and this can also be called Eat, Stop, Eat. Eat, Stop, Eat is actually a pretty good book out there about intermittent fasting. Um, and uh, you can definitely get a lot of good information from it. But what the whole day fasting states is that one to two days out of the week, you're going to fast for 24 hours. So we talked about this already. You can say on Monday, you're going to eat from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., right? And then you're going to fast the next day all the way on Tuesday until 8 p.m. again. That's 24 hour fast, right? What's nice about this is it's flexible, okay? You can eat every single day with it. So you're not actually going a full like day without eating while you are going 24 hours without feeding, right? You aren't actually you're able to eat every single day with it. It's flexible. You can make it what you want. You could do 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. It's however you want to do it. It's up to you. Again, and I'm going to state this over and over and over again, you still should eat sensibly when on non-fasting days. Now, if you are choosing to do intermittent fasting, to be in a calorically restricted state because you want to lose body fat and you want to lose weight, if you eat at the your total daily energy expenditure, which again, your total daily energy expenditure is the amount of calories you burn each day with your basal metabolic rate and your activity. So if you ate at your total daily energy expenditure every day of the week, in theory, you should not gain nor lose weight. However, if you completely subtracted two days out of the week from that, from fasting, in the week, you would result in about a 20 to 30% reduction of your total intake for the week, which would result in weight loss and fat loss. Because again, the only way to lose weight is to be in a calorically restricted state. We're just doing it in a different format with intermittent fasting. Another way that we see, uh, well, and just to kind of give, because I said I would talk about some of the benefits with each one of these protocols, um, but we'll talk about uh, benefits overall of fasting. You do see them a lot with all these different protocols. But with some of that, just to spit out real quickly for a whole day fasting that I wrote down here, is we see a lot of the metabolic factors, such as increased HDL, which is your good cholesterol, are increased, right? We see decreased uh, systemic inflammation throughout the body. Um, and as we know now that systemic inflammation is a precursor to many of uh, today's uh, metabolic diseases and other diseases, actually. Um, you see decreased body weight, decreased body fat. Uh, and then we're comparing essentially what we call ad lipidum and feeding or just eating however we want as many times throughout the day compared to whole day fasting when calorie intake is the same for each one. So say I'm eating 2000 calories in the whole day fasting and I'm eating uh, on average and I'm eating 2000 calories 
on the limited uh, uh, daily feeding. So I'm on a calorically restricted diet, but I'm eating 2000 calories a day this way is you actually see more beneficial metabolic markers with the intermittent fasting. Now I'm going to alternate day fasting. This one typically seems to be harder for individuals because it's a much longer fasting period of time. So this is where you would eat every other day, right? And again, you might only do this two times within the week. And just to kind of like stop right here, I don't recommend anybody to go past 24 hours of fasting. It doesn't mean that bad things are happening after 24 hours. Um, bad things really don't start to arise until you get real deep into the fast, like honestly past 72 hours, um, and all the way up to like, you know, five, six, seven days, right? Um, I don't think anybody wants to fast that long, but typically you're going to see all the same benefits uh, from a 24 hour fast. And actually even earlier from like the 12 to 18 hour to 24 hour windows, you're seeing a lot of these good metabolic ma uh, markers. However, um, going, some people like doing the alternate day fasting because there is benefits from a 36 hour fast, right? Um, you do see a bigger attrition rate with this, a bigger dropout. But an example of this is, you say you would eat from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. on Monday, and then you would fast all the way then through the next day until Wednesday at 8 a.m., resulting in like a 36-hour fast. However, it's flexible. You could take that to 6 a.m., you could take it to 7 a.m., or you could take it all the way to 10 a.m. You could take it to 12, right? It's however you want to do it. Now, what we see is some of the benefits of alternate day fasting is, again, decreased fast, also decreased visceral fat. Um, you see uh, increased markers of something called the adiponectin, which is a marker to be able to stimulate fat or lipolysis. So fat utilization is energy. So it's the hormone that regulates metabolism of lipids, right? You see in, in all fasting, you're going to see this uh, in all calorically restricted diets. You'll see this is uh, decreased insulin levels and increased insulin sensitivity. Uh, overall decreased cholesterol and increased uh, HDL again, which is your good cholesterol. So with these, some of these facts that I'm talking about are from the individual studies I pulled from these different types of feeding windows or uh, protocols for intermittent fasting. And then we'll talk about uh, on the benefits section of what the benefits are for fasting in general. Now modified eating regimens kind of takes that alternate day fasting and makes it a little bit easier. So essentially what you will do on your fasting days is you restrict your intake to 25% of your daily intake on that fasting day. So individuals still eat on their fasting days, but a very small amount. So let's take an example. So let's we do our normal intake from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. on Monday. Our fasting day is gonna be Tuesday, but we eat 500 calories at noon for lunch. However, we fast all the way until 8 a.m. on Wednesday, so we actually still get a 20-hour full fast. Again, you could put that to 6 a.m. and get an eight-hour fast. If you want to wake up at 4 a.m. and get a 16-hour fast, you could do that again, too. You can literally manipulate all these numbers to be able to fit your lifestyle. That's why we say it's a lifestyle. You can manipulate these numbers to be able to fit whatever your lifestyle is. Um, so we see a lot of the same benefits from alternate day fasting that we do in the modified eating regimens. Now, time-restricted feeding, this is the one that's the most popular and what people are doing the most with, which interestingly enough is actually the one that has the least amount of research done on it because it's more new. And, uh, and essentially, it, it, to be honest, time-restricted feeding is how I uh, manipulate my intermittent fasting and what I typically recommend to individuals. Um, again, like I said, you do see from those 12 to 24 hour periods of time, those metabolic markers that are beneficial, this uh, neurological markers that are showing up are all showing up within uh, this time frame as well. And it just seems to be a little bit easier. It definitely fits my lifestyle a lot easier because I was always one to skip breakfast anyways. So what you do in a uh, time restricted feeding is you set up a fasting window and you set up a eating window. So for example, you will have a, maybe a 16-8, which means you fast for 16 hours, and then you have an eight-hour period of time where you intake all the calories that you want. And again, you could be in a surplus, you could be at maintenance, or you could be in a deficit. It's whatever you're trying to do. So for example, you could eat from 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. every single day. However, you fast from 8 p.m. to noon the next day. The nice thing about that is a large amount of your fasting window is, as you can see with all of these, is when you're sleeping because we all fast, right? We all fast when we're sleeping, unless we're a night eater, which you should definitely stop that. If that's you, there's definitely some bad into things with that. Um, but the time restricted feeding, like the 16 eight, you could do uh, a 14 six, you could do an 18 or a 14 10, you could do an 18 six. You can manipulate them all the ways that you want. Typically, if I'm going to have people start with it, I start them with a 12 12, and then we work up to a 12, like a 14 uh, uh, 10, and then a 16 eight. And I typically stay at the 16 eight. So 
what we do see sometimes with time restricted uh, feeding when comparing it to individuals, and this is again what the research is saying that are eating at, at will essentially, right? And uh, this, this specific research design was utilizing a high fat diet. So calories were kept the same in each one of the groups. So your time restricted feeding was eating as many calories as the, uh, the individuals who could eat how many times throughout the day. So they're eating the total amount of calories the same. However, what we saw is that the time restricted feeding actually had beneficial metabolic markers. Um, they actually did not gain weight. Okay. And what we saw in the other group was damaged metabolic markers and an increase in obesity. We've also seen in human studies that the 16-8 window has uh, decreased LDLs, which is your bad cholesterol, and increased HDLs, right? Um, and interesting, well, what was seen in actually one study, and again, this is one study, so it's hard to say, but I just wanted to bring it up because it was kind of interesting. When doing a time-restricted feeding window where they had a four-hour period of time to eat their meals, when there was only one meal eaten compared to three meals eaten in that four hour period of time, the group that only did one meal actually preserved more lean muscle mass than the other group, which I just thought was really interesting. So some other notes when it comes to these is we see that glycerol appearance and glycerol is a, is a form. Uh, so the, your fatty acids are stored in your body as something called triglycerides, which is a glycerol molecule and three fatty acids. So triglyceride, right? And when we see glycerol appearance in the blood, that shows that we're going through lipolysis, which is the breakdown of fatty acids and utilizing fatty acids as our energy source. So we actually see glycerol appearance was greatest between the 12 and 24 hour periods of time. And the glycerol appearance in that 12 to 24 hour period of time actually accounted for 60% of all glycerol within a 72 hour fasting window. So you're getting a huge amount of fatty acid production to be utilized as energy, i.e. fat loss in that 12 to 24 hour period of time, which is again why I don't have individuals typically go past 24 hours. So you're seeing not the other benefits, but definitely this is a benefit when it comes to fat loss, right? So that was very interesting. I will say that the greatest amount of it was in between the 18 to 24 hour period of time. So those are our different protocols and there's all kinds of different other protocols that will fall within each one of these frameworks. I'm sure you've maybe heard about the 5-2 and all those kinds of things. There's all kinds of different types of frameworks, but they typically fall within one of these frameworks. So now let's get into some of the misconceptions about fasting because there's a lot of stuff that's thrown out there. Um, it's snake oil, whatever it may be, or there's all kinds of uh, uh, just misconceptions when it comes to short-term fasting. Okay. So first and foremost, they claim that fasting decreases your metabolic rate. This is not true by any means. So in a study uh, that was conducted at the University of Nottingham, researchers found that when uh, 29 men and women fasted for up to three days, their metabolic rate did not change. Remember that your metabolic rate is the amount of calories that you are burning throughout the day. Uh, days of metabolic rate is how many calories you're burning at rest. If I sat here and did nothing, my body burns the dominant amount of calories that it goes through. And then when you add activity levels on top of that, that would be total daily energy expenditure. That is one study. There is multiple studies that have shown that even long, long periods of fast do not affect your metabolic rate. So it's not going to slow it down. Now, what I have on your little bullet here is the multiple, uh, more frequent meals increases your metabolic rate fallacy. So what was believed for a long period of time, there's this thing called the thermic effect when you eat food. When I eat food, I have to break it down to turn it into the constituents that I produce energy with or the nutrients that I utilize to help these enzymatic functions take place within the body. And it takes energy to be able to break these foods down. So it's not, oh, if I eat a bunch of small meals throughout the day, I'm going to burn more calories because I'm eating more often. However, the thermic effect is not based on how many times you eat, it's based on the total amount of calories that you eat. So if you ate 3,000 calories in three meals throughout the day compared to 3,000 calories in six meals throughout the day, the total expenditure of calories is not different because it's dependent on the calorie intake, not the amount of times that you're eating. So the idea behind six small meals throughout the day burns more calories than eating more often is completely false. Um, that's one thing that I really like to explain to people because it's like, whoa, I've been told that for a long period of time, and it's a huge fallacy, okay? So one, intermittent fasting, short-term fasting does not decrease your metabolic rate. Number two, it does not deteriorate your muscle, nor does being in a calorically restricted uh, diet for a certain amount of time actually deteriorate your muscle. 
Um, there's actually something I'm going to bring up at the end of here. Uh, I actually had a good friend uh, who had created, the, him and a bunch of individuals did an article uh, about, do you need to be in an energy surplus for muscle hypertrophy to take place? And the short answer is no, you don't. And it's awesome to see that because um, there's always been this, I, I got to eat big, get big. I got to be my bulking phase to get uh, muscle. And I always laugh because I've had multiple clients who have been on caloric deficit diets um, who have actually gained lean body mass while losing body fat at the same time. So I've always known practically that this was true, but I never actually, you know, sought it out in the research. However, the way that you preserve lean muscle mass when you're in a calorically restricted diet or you're doing intermittent fasting, which is just another form of a calorically restricted diet, is through mechanical stimulus on your muscles. If you actually resistance train, there is a must, enough protein synthesis taking place to not only preserve your muscle, but to actually increase the muscle mass that you have, right? Obviously, if you're in an extreme calorically restricted state, if you're only eating 500 calories a day, that's going to cause some issues. But as long as you are not maybe, you know, going below 15 to 20% of your total daily energy expenditure, you're still putting mechanical stress on your muscles. That is enough to be able to maintain your muscle mass, if not increase your lean muscle mass. Now, I will say it is evident within the research that this is easier for overweight and obese individuals to do. The leaner you get, the harder it will be. It's, and I don't mean the harder it will be to preserve it, but the harder it will be to be able to gain more in a deficit. Um, regardless, though, even in their huge review, it was stated that to be able to increase lean muscle mass, you want to be conservative. They utilize kilojoules for energy expenditure, but I did the conversion. They said anywhere from like around 400 to 600 calories of a surplus is where you would essentially converse, uh, conservatively start people because you still see hypertrophy and muscle increase taking place in that deficit. And we'll talk more about that later. Also, that intermittent fasting or short-term fasting develops hypoglycemia, which is low blood sugar. Everyone's like, oh, I got a headache. I don't feel good. I'm not getting enough blood sugar in. There is so many articles out there that show that you, you may drop a little bit in your blood sugar levels, but nothing below what's considered the normal range. So the reason these things are taking place and you're feeling this way is just operation, offering conditioning you, just preconditioned states of you eating at certain times and expecting to have certain foods at certain times. It has nothing to do with your blood sugar levels unless you have a blood sugar issue, right? If you are, uh, you know, a typical healthy individual. So, and this was even shown up to like upwards of 36 hours, 72 hours with the fasting. Also, it does, uh, it does not reduce your muscle glycogen content, okay? Uh, muscle glycogen, you have about 300 to 400 in a normal individual. The bigger you are, the more muscle glycogen you can store. But about 300 to 400 grams stored within your muscle within the body, okay? Um, and when you are fasting, or even when you're in a ketogenic state and you're not actually eating a bunch of carbohydrates to be able to be turned into glycogen to be stored in the muscle, you actually have other products that are being developed from other uh, energy systems in the body that's going to be able to go through a process that we talked about in depth during our Protein 101 and ketogenic diet uh, uh, webinar called gluconeogenesis, right? So we actually see that the production of lactate and gluconeogenesis means taking a non-carbohydrate source and turning it into glucose. So gluco being glucose, neo being new, genesis being generating, right? So what you see actually in the body when there's lactate developed, which happens during a certain, you know, uh, type of activity, that that can actually go to the liver and be turned into glucose and could be stored as glycogen, right? Uh, glycerol can actually be go, go through, which is part of the, you know, fatty acids, right? That can actually be go through gluconeogenesis and turn into glycogen and be stored in the muscles. So there's all kinds of different processes in the body where the body has been smart, smart enough to be able to store the amount of glycogen and glucose that you need to be able to sustain basic functions, even if you are in a deficit, even if you are in a fasted state, or even if you are in a ketogenic state, okay? Also, it does not diminish the muscle contractile rate, how hard that you can contract your muscles or how much power or effort you can put into these things. So one thing that I wrote down here to make sure to say is research has found that even after a three-day fast, there was no negative effect on how strongly participants' muscles would contract their ability to do short-term high-intensity exercise or their ability to exercise at moderate intensities for long durations, okay? We also don't see impairs in cardiovascular performance. However, I would not advise this, uh, nor would anybody advise uh, this style of a diet nor a ketogenic diet, honestly, for that matter, for super high and dense endurance athletes, such as Ironman style triathlons, Mohabs, uh, those like things where you're going 240 miles, right? 
I would definitely suggest a very high rich carbohydrate diet where you're eating quite frequently. Um, it does not decrease brain function. It's actually completely the opposite. And we're going to talk about that in depth here. Um, and that is something, again, where the neurological benefits that we're going to be talking about, we've seen in rodent studies, but, uh, and I know anecdotal evidence don't really mean anything to anybody, but anecdotally, I've seen a lot of benefit uh, neurologically and also with individuals who uh, I know or have uh, put on intermittent fasting diets. And we'll talk about those in a little bit. Intermittent fasting also does not decrease your testosterone. Um, a lot of males are, pretty, are uh, concerned about this. Um, and I should just state that your testosterone is actually at its highest after you wake up in the morning. It's actually 20 to 30% higher after you wake up. And that's weird because that's after a very long fast when you've been sleeping. So we actually see that your highest testosterone rates are after a fasted state. Um, we actually do see a reduction in testosterone after eating. So sometimes uh, it's been proposed by certain individuals that the longer you can stay in a fasted state, the longer you can have those elevated levels of testosterone. Um, so short-term fasting does not affect testosterone even after a 58 hour fast. There may, and what the research showed there is there was a small reduction around the 60 hour period of time, but it was not below normal levels. It took all the way for nine straight days of significant uh, of fasting to have a significant decrease in testosterone. So the other thing is, is fasting decreases leptin levels. Well, um, and leptin is a very misunderstood hormone in the body and that could be a whole other webinar on itself. It does lots of things, but one of the things that we've seen with leptin is that it has a role in energy expenditure, the ability to burn calories. However, um, this research got pushed too far because sometimes what we see in mice doesn't always happen in humans, huh? which is funny because we're going to talk about that stuff with neurological benefits here. So again, still, you know, being, being open-minded skeptic with these kinds of things. However, what was seen in some research is that when you were, uh, you had certain mice that were deprived of leptin, they had, uh, you know, essentially, they were genetically created not to be able to produce leptin. They were going, they got 80% heavier or more obese than uh, mice that did not, that did have natural uh, levels of leptin. When leptin was then injected in these mice, they lost all that weight. So then it was decided that leptin is what controls uh, your uh, uh, caloric expenditure. While it plays a role in it, it definitely plays a role in it. When seeing this in humans, it did not exactly transfer over the exact same way, okay? Um, so with that, we saw no change. I just wanna read here to make sure I get it right. So however, in human subjects, we have seen no change in metabolic rate, even when there is a reduction of 80% of leptin in individuals. So there was no slowdown in a human subject's basal metabolic rate when they were even reduced to 80% leptins. So what you do see in fasting is during the fasting window is you actually do have a dip in leptin, right? So it is taking place during the fast. However, after you go back into your fasting state, you maintain your leptin levels over the long haul and sometimes it actually increases. So an intermittent fasting regimen plus a calorically restricted state can actually maintain or slightly boost average leptin levels so thus, what happens during a fast may not actually be representative of what happens because of the fast. So these are just some common misconceptions that you may have come across, and I just wanted to kind of lay those out so you all could kind of see them. So now we have this fun slide for a lot of the benefits that we see for intermittent fasting, short-term fasting, and long, uh, not long-term fasting, but intermittent short-term fasting. So I broke it down into body composition, hormonal, cellular, neurological, and in the microbiome, okay? So first off, I think we've uh, talked about in depth that we decrease body fat via caloric restriction. It's able to preserve muscle mass, right? We increase lipolysis and fatty uh, acid oxidation through increased adiponectin, right? I can never say that correctly. Um, and this also all leads to decreased systemic inflammation. So one thing that we see with fasting is increased fatty oxidation. Remember, if you watch the intro to ketogenic diet, when you are in a fasted state, you typically go into a ketogenic state, which is going to increase the utilization of ketones and fatty acids as energy sources. So we're actually going to see the body in a fasted state utilize fatty acids at a better capability, i.e. Lead, uh, leading to fat reduction. Okay. Hormonal, one of the big things that we see with intermittent fasting and also calorically restricted diets, but definitely with our intermittent fasting is you see a decrease in insulin and an increase in insulin sensitivity. 
Um, so if you know what type 2 diabetes is, this is due to insulin resistance in the body due to consistent exposure to carbohydrates and glucose being put into the body. Excessive amounts of glucose constantly coming in is going to desensitize insulin, which is essentially the shuttling molecule that takes you know, glucose where it needs to go. It does more than just that. But over and over and over again, if you continually eat glucose or glucose uh, type or carbohydrates, which turn into glucose um, nonstop, the body's like, I don't need any more of this. So it downregulates its insulin pumps, no longer, you know, uh, glucose is being utilized, elevations of blood glucose in the body leads to type two diabetes, right? Um, that's why it's called onset diabetes. Uh, so what we see from partially restricting ourselves from eating is we actually increase that insulin sensitivity. So at the time that we actually do eat these carbohydrates and they come into our body, we are upregulated to be actually, actually be able to utilize the glucose that comes in. So there is less left over in the blood and actually the muscles that need it are able to utilize it at a higher capability. Um, due to the fact that we are decreasing the amount of glucose constantly coming in, that also means that we're going to decrease the amount of insulin that is coming in. Okay. Um, but when it does, when we do have those carbohydrates come in, it's used at a better capability. Now, when there is a decrease in insulin, that means there's going to be an increase in something called glucagon. And then glucagon does many things, like all these hormones don't just do one thing, but one of the main things that glucagon does is a signaler for fatty acid oxidation or lipolysis to take place, i.e. Leading, leading to that fat reduction. One of the huge benefits that we see is an increase in growth hormone. This is the only anabolic hormone that's increased by, anabol uh, by, by anabolic steroids, obviously, but uh, by intermittent fasting. Okay. And growth hormone injections are what you're seeing in the anti-aging community. Growth hormone is a huge thing. Okay. It plays a role in maintaining blood glucose levels. It increases lipolysis and decreases glucose utilization, and it does not allow for muscle loss. Um, there is so much that goes into the increase of, of growth hormone with regard to fasting that that itself could also be its own webinar, but we're not going to go down that rabbit hole. But we see a large increase in growth hormone, which again is kind of this anti-aging uh, miracle hormone within the body. That is that how people would term it. Uh, we see, we've already talked about the maintenance of testosterone and leptin, and then we actually have ghrelin control. So ghrelin is what is the hormone that is essentially going to tell you when you're hungry or not. Now, what we see is actually ghrelin is produced at the times that we typically eat. So if we are an individual who eats six times throughout the day, and then we start going to an intermittent fasting regimen to where we are only eating twice a day, when our body typically knows to eat, ghrelin is naturally produced during those times. So what happens over time is the body is smart and will adjust. And if it's no longer taking in food, it's no longer going to produce ghrelin at those times. That's why I tell people, you need to give yourself at least a month to be able to adjust to intermittent fasting because it takes a little bit of time for those things to kind of chill out. So you can actually decrease the amount of ghrelin that's going to be produced throughout those certain times that you were typically eating. So you were able to kind of control that and decrease the hunger pains that you're going to have. All this then leads to decreased inflammation. Cellular level, we see, uh, I put decreased systemic inflammation up there twice, but it's happening quite a bit, so it's going to be beneficial. One thing that we do see is increased and optimized autophagy. This is cellular turnover, cellular death, the ability to break down our cells and be able to get rid of the things that we need to and allow good things to build back up. We also see an increase in heat shock proteins, which uh, heat shock proteins, uh, I was at, this is something learned, new that I was able to learn uh, from intermittent fasting, from the new intermittent fasting research that I did. Uh, Cause I knew a lot about heat shock proteins through sauna therapy and things like that. Uh, but some of the things that heat shock proteins are able to do is help the folding of proteins. So when you are repairing tissue, repairing damaged muscle from, you know, like a workout or something like that, it, pro it helps in the proper um, development of those proteins, right? And you'll see it actually goes over into the neurological system that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, we have increased sirtuins, okay? Uh, this is a new area of research. And uh, one of the things that we do see with these increased sirtuins is that they have uh, the ability to kind of aid in cellular homeostasis, um, which is going to decrease inflammation around the cells. And uh, there's early reports that they can actually be beneficial in anti-cancer effects and actually slow tumor, tumor, uh, tumor growth and assist in chemotherapy. 
this is probably the area where I have the least amount of information on intermittent fasting. But if you want to learn more about sirtuins, um, Dr. Rhonda Patrick is a great individual to learn this kind of stuff from. I found this in the research, but I've heard her talking about sirtuins before, and she's just a wizard. Um, all this, again, leads to decreased systemic inflammation, which is going to decrease a lot of the metabolic disorders that we're coming across. With neurological, so one of the things that we actually see through um, uh, basic anaerobic and aerobic exercise is an increase of something called BDNF, which stands for brain-derived neurotropic factor. And what this does is it aids in neuroplasticity and neurogenesis, which is essentially protection of the neurons in the brain, that's neuroplasticity, and neurogenesis is the birth of new neurons. Um, one of the reasons why rec centers are around today, so like where I work and why there's so many universities that have huge rec centers, is because exercise produces BDNF. BDNF aids in academic performance and memory retention. So this is a huge reason why we have these big funding capabilities to have these big gyms here because we know that physical activity actually benefits academic performance. However, from intermittent fasting, you see a huge increase with brain-derived neurotropic factor as well, along with other neurotropic factors that aid in not only neuronal protection, but also neuronal health, genesis, uh, or generate, uh, uh, gen generating more, and things of that nature. And again, when we're going through these neurological benefits, all the ones that I have found have been on rodent studies. I have not seen any of these in human studies. If there is out there, please send them my way. We also see the decrease of reactive oxygen species. So just remember like anything that's taking place within the body, when there's functions taking place, there's oxidation happening, which can cause damage, right? It's just like rusting on a car is the way that we've had uh, instructors teach that before. Um, and this can actually be also from the benefit of those heat shock proteins, which benefit the neurological system as well. In a fasting state, we already talked about in our ketogenic uh, webinar uh, that we have an increase of ketone bodies, namely beta hydroxybutyrate, and when we see in a fasting state that we see a twofold increase in beta hydroxybutyrate, which can also protect our neurological system, right? And also aids for uh, a lot of the neurological functions that we have and can also, all, it could all the way go over to the hormonal section and can actually uh, be utilized as an energy source as well. Um, we see increased resistance, uh, resistance to uh, exotic exotoxic stress. I can never say that word right either. Um, and that's also going to be coming from uh, heat shock proteins. Interesting thing that I did see in the research on rodents was when you, uh, they have, I forget what the acid was called, but they were able to, you know, they had one group of mice on an intermittent fasting diet and another group of mice not on an intermittent fasting diet. And it was, it was actually uh, on a calorically restricted diet. So you had your intermittent fasting and a calorically restricted diet. When they put an acid into their brain that would induce seizures to these mice after, you know, they removed the brains from these mice and they examined them is there was less neuronal death in the intermittent fasting diet mice than there was in the calorically restricted diet mice. And this is thought to be for the fact that there's the increased amount of beta hydroxybutyrate in those ketone bodies that are going to be able to help the protection of those neurons along with the heat shock proteins. Um, and then this also leads to decreased neurological damage along with that inflammation. Finally, the microbiome is a huge, uh, you know, area of research right now. This is essentially your gut flora. Uh, I don't know if you knew this, but there is actually more uh, bacteria, there's more bacteria uh, cells in your gut than there is human cells in your entire body. So you're actually more bacteria than you are human. And essentially, uh, some people think that we developed to be able to host them, right? Uh, which is a super interesting fact. And the microbiome plays a huge role in um, our health. Uh, a bad um, distribution of our gut microbiota, which is a huge array of them, can lead to all kinds of uh, uh, issues within our body, whether it be metabolic or even lots of neurological disorders are being uh, discussed with regard to having what they call leaky gut or gut permeability. So what you see with intermittent fasting is that you increase the diversity of the gut flora and having a good gut uh, diversity of gut flora is beneficial to its health. Um, it actually reduces what I was just talking about, that leaky gut, the gut permeability. And then it, this will all lead to decreased systemic inflammation. Um, the microbiome is also a very interesting area of research. Um, learning about like how probiotics and prebiotics can all help that kind of stuff is definitely beneficial to overall health. And again, we don't need to go down that rabbit hole as well. Um, there is all kinds of good books out there about it, though. If you did want to read a really good one that has to do with the microbiome and neurological health, it is called Brain Maker. Um, and it's very, very interesting. 
So now some of the drawbacks when it comes to intermittent fasting. First off, some people are going to get very, very hangry at first. Uh, I used to be the most hangry person in the world. If I did not get food at the times that I wanted to, I was not fun to be around. I was very irritable. I was just annoying, right? And literally the second I would eat, I would feel better. There was no way when I started intermittent fasting that I ever think that was going to go away. It did. It definitely did, but it took like a month. Um, but that is one of the drawbacks, and some people do not like dealing with it, okay? Another drawback is it has a big attrition rate because people get hangry and they don't like the idea of it. Uh, a lot of people drop out of it. So, you know, a lot of people stick with it. And that actually kind of has to go into the fact that it can have social implications. Sometimes it's not fun to be out with everybody when you're in a fasted state and they're all eating and you can't eat because you're, you know, in a fasting state. How you learn how to deal with that is if you're in that situation, just eat with them and then extend your fasting window at that point, right? If I was doing a 16-8 and I was like, oh, we're having uh, my fasting window in the 8, but we're having, you know, some food at 9 o'clock, I could eat at 9, 9.30 and then just get that 16 hours in again, right? Um, but still, uh, typically when you start out, I would say you try to be as strong as you can for a long period of time. So it definitely can have implications. I got used to it having water and things like that instead. Um, but you can figure out ways to manipulate around that. Sometimes it definitely result in binge eating. We already talked about that you should really try to focus on, uh, you know, eating sensibly on your non-fasting days, but some people are just like, oh, well, I can eat whatever I want because I fasted, and that's definitely not beneficial in the long run through to other uh, issues that can be developed. And then finally, like I said already, a lot of the studies on intermittent fasting have been on rodents and animals, and not always what results in rodents and animals will transfer over to human beings. So again, you have to take a lot of the stuff that I've talked about today, uh, you know, with a grain of salt. And I would always suggest being an open-minded skeptic, be open to the things that you are hearing, but be skeptical enough to do your own due diligence and your own research to make your own informed decision. And hopefully that's another reason why you're watching this webinar. So those are some of the drawbacks that we typically see with intermittent fasting. Now, Again, a word on muscular hypertrophy, right? So we've already kind of talked about this uh, at the beginning, but when you are in this fasted state or when you are in a calorically restricted state, that does not mean that you cannot maintain nor lose muscular hypertrophy, okay? Um, there uh, is a lot of research on this. And like I said, a guy that I know who's actually on the board for NASM as a nutrition consultant, uh, him and a large uh, amount of very credible individuals came out with a review that discussed this in depth and reviewed all the research that they could get a hold of in a review, like a systematic review, to be able to look at this. And time and time again, you can see that you definitely can benefit and maintain your muscle mass when in a deficit, and you can actually increase your muscle mass when you're in a deficit. The main thing is, if you are in a calorically restricted state or you are intermittent fasting where there is a caloric restriction, the way that you preserve that muscle mass is by resistance training. If you do this stuff without resistance training, you definitely will lose muscle mass. But the protein synthesis that you get from typical weight training will be able to benefit you without, with maybe increasing or definitely maintaining that muscular hypertrophy that you have. And then finally, it's always important to kind of live by Aristotle right? So we are what we repeatedly do. Thus, excellence then is not an act, but a habit. This means that you can't just do something for two weeks and expect results. You can't just try this thing a couple of times here and there. If you're going to jerk, you need to jerk as often as possible, right? Everything that you are going to put into play is all about the amount of dedication that you put into it, okay? So, any one of these things that you try to do, do not, there is no magic pill. The magic pill is consistency and you have to be consistent with these things and expect a slow result that will be maintained for a longer period of time. When you do see these drastic results that take place and you're dropping 20 pounds in a matter of, I don't know, two weeks, that weight is not going to stay off, okay? It's all about dedication and staying to it. 